Tableau 10, From Poles to Bombs, Part 1, Enter the Binomial Distribution. The tableau will be in two parts. Part 1 will introduce the august binomial distribution, the first of the three fundamental distributions in the theory of chance. And as we shall see, it arises naturally through the consideration of polling processes. The second part will deal with the emergence of the whimsical, mysterious Poisson distribution, and that will be in the context of rare events. Okay. And as we shall see, a noteworthy example, a remarkable example, arises when you look at the distribution of bomb heads. So, this is our setting for the current tableau, and without further ado, let's start by discussing the setting from which the binomial distribution arises. Let me start with a political setting that is familiar to many people. In many countries, we have, let's say, two dominant parties, political parties, and here is a montage showing, for example, how political persuasions changed across the United States over a century or so. Uh, the two dominant political parties in the U.S. at this time are the Republicans and the Democrats. And as you see across the montage of images, the density of Republican and Democrat concentration has changed quite dramatically in time. This is familiar to individuals in many political settings. And so let me abstract out what is key here. We are thinking about two political parties in a country. And at a large level, what we have seen now is that the, at least the voting populace of a country, are split into two primary subpopulations. In the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans, but in, of course, in other countries, you can replace them by two other uh, large political parties of your choice. There are other examples of settings where we have dichotomous populations or principally dichotomous populations. Here's another example, this time from environmental science. A consequence of humans traveling faster and quicker around the world is that they carry indigenous species with them to far off locales. This can have undesirable and sometimes very deleterious consequences to the local environment. Spectacular instances of this arise, for example, in the Florida Everglades, where the creature at the top of the pyramid is the Florida alligator. But over the last century, a, an interloper arrived, the Burmese python. Now, of course, the Burmese python is not native to these parts. It was brought in from Asia, perhaps released into the wild when it became inconveniently large, and found that the environment was very conducive to spreading. And so it did. And now we have two large creatures sitting at the top of the pyramid, and that's causing changes to the entire pyramidal structure of uh, existence within the Florida Everglades. There are many other examples. For instance, in the African Great Lakes, the Victoria, Malawi, and Tanganyika, the native fish, or the cichlids, are languid, high biodiversity, are rather placid as a species. In the middle of the 20th century, an aggressive interloper was introduced for sports fishing purposes. This was the Nile perch. And of course, in retrospect, it is clear what would happen. The Nile perch started taking over, staking out large domains in these waters. Two, of course, the detriment of the cichlids. What is the proportion of the Nile perch to the cichlids today? We know it is an issue, but how does one figure out how big an issue it is? Still another example of a dichotomous population arises in industrial quality control, whether it is of computer chips, cars, wrenches, or what have you. An organization, when they produce a product, want to make sure the product is of high quality because recalls are expensive and lead to bad publicity. 
And therefore, the quality control process tries to identify objects that are not up to snuff, objects that are defective. If the manufacturing process creates too many defective entities, then the organization suffers. What proportion of the production is defective? Still yet another example of a, di a dichotomous population. We've already seen examples of recessive and lethal genes. Different genetic variations, let's say there are two of them, cause a dichotomous population falling into one or the other camp. What proportion of the population, say, has got a recessive and lethal gene, say that of sickle cell anemia? One more example to set the stage. And of course, this is very familiar to all of us. If we open a newspaper, listen to the news, watch a blog, read a blog. Opinion polls. What opinions do people have, positive or negative, on a variety of topics? For example, it could be highly controversial, uh, universal health care on one hand versus individual choice on the other, armed intervention into a troubled part of the world or not, and so on and so forth. In all these instances, we have an example of an underlying population, possibly very large in number, and that population consists primarily of two pieces. It is a dichotomous population. Of course, we understand that in the real world, we can have more than two subpopulations. But of course, as George Polier would recommend for us, when we start looking at a complex problem, it is wise to start by looking at the simplest version of the problem we don't understand. In any case, in all the examples I've listed for you on the screen, all of these are instances where populations are largely or primarily dichotomous. And in such settings, the basic, the fundamental question that arises for us is the following. How can we estimate the makeup of the subpopulation mix of the underlying population.